Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for September 27th, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Q Factor Real Time Data Transfer Optimization. Our presenter is Florida International University's Geronimo Bezerra. Um, Geronimo is an Associate Director of IT for FIU Center for Internet Augmented Research and Assessment. Welcome, Geronimo. Well, thank you, Janetti, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Well, since the introduction is done, so let me, let me work and share my screen here. Uh, this will stop other screen sharing, yes. Uh, Jeanette, can you confirm you see my slides in presentation mode? Yep, looks great, thank you. Perfect, okay, Okay. thank you, great. Uh, good morning again. Uh, again, my name is Ron Bezier here at Florida International University. I have here on the call, uh, Dr. Richard Ziva from ESNET, he's a co-PI, also Dr. Julio Ibarra from FIU also as a co-PI. Q-Factor is an assist star project uh, and the NSF program director is Dr. Deep Medi. So this is the outline of the, the presentation today uh, as a PI of, uh, of the Q-Factor has the honor to talk about, introduce to the community. We're gonna be talking about motivation, goals, why now, uh, how we're gonna be leveraging new technologies to support this, pro this project and the concepts that we're creating as distributed management plan, uh, telemetry agent. Then in the end, I'm gonna talk about the science drivers that could possibly benefit from this project, how we plan to engage the community and show the team that's working on this. So uh, very easy, like very quickly, just give a little motivation. Um, all of us here at eventually, we have to do some tuning for operational system. It could be for achieving better bandwidth, achieving better performance for uh, processing for memory utilization for supporting a process disk access uh, and this is very uh, common in IT life but when you're talking about doing this kind of optimization for data transfers this we're seeing this is a very complex and time consuming activities there are multiple factors that you have to take into consideration such as hardware configuration operational system software round tree time if the transport protocol is TCP UDP all of those have different metrics and different approaches for, for a tuning process when you're creating like building a data transfer node, for example. The, the default practice uh, or the call the best practices today is maxing out the tuning parameters. Uh, so basically we set all the tunings, all the buffers, all everything that could be set for best performance, uh, which grants us the best performance we're looking for most of the time, but it also weighs a lot of the host's resources because every time you set the the buffers for writing or for read, uh, writing and, uh, and reading and the uh, TCP IP kernel. That means that all the process that we're gonna create sockets are gonna uh, allocate that memory and not necessarily you need all the memory for a socket because sometimes you're doing data transfer someone on campus, someone in your metro or regional network. And unfortunately, there's no single tuning configuration. There's no one solution fits all. Uh, because hardware is different, software is different, purpose is different, and who you talk to in this environment, uh, uh, it could be in a different locality, it could be in a campus, could be in another side of the planet. So this makes it a little bit more challenging for us. And over time, the context might change. So you can have a new hardware, you can start talking to people that are closer or far away. Uh, so maybe you need more buffer to accommodate higher round trip times. So the motivation behind Q-Factor is what if tuning could be done dynamically based on the hardware, operational system, software, also RTT and transport. So this is a very quick example. This is a data transfer that we create as part of the proposal. Uh, the, the, we have uh, in our network, we have hosts in Chile, we have hosts in the US. And uh, a typical data transfer, uh, if you just install the full Linux installation, it comes in a generic mode uh, and you try to transfer from Chile to the US, then you're gonna see the performance on the left side, which is 18 megabits per second, because this is an 120 milliseconds round trip time. 
And we created a script that every 30 seconds do some tuning. And then you see 31 increase a little bit and, and 61 and then 91 until we get the maximum performance for those 10 gig DTN nodes. Um, and those are just basic tuning, meaning uh, that if you just change the default behavior of the host, you can get a lot more performance because the default configuration is not made for that, is to be a generic node. It could be including like a desktop. So this is not new to any one of you in the audience, uh, but this here shows that there are multiple tuning that you can do that gives you a little bit of a bump. You start seeing little by little, uh, and uh, because we're doing like each one of those parameters in a different moment. So why does that happen, right? So this is uh, associate how TCP works. There's a congestion control algorithm uh, you all know very well. Basically, TCP was created to share the network infrastructure uh, with other hosts in the same infrastructure. Uh, the problem is TCP doesn't know for sure that I'm sharing resources uh, with another user. I don't know if there's another user when you're in TCP mode. And the main indication that TCP has to accomplish this goal, to understand if there's more people or more hosts sharing the infrastructure, is when I start receiving confirmations that the messages that were sent uh, were received by the other side. And this is reflected through the ACT mechanism. So the ACT pretty much just say, look, I got the whole destination host says, I got this pack that keep going. And this is a key behavior for different uh, uh, congestion control algorithms mostly because TCP is an act pacing protocol. It's gonna send and wait for confirmation after some time and send and asking for confirmation after some time. Uh, but a key, a key point here is that the reason why we have this oscillation in performance is because every time that I hit the limit of the network, a host reached the limit with a data transfer, then you see the packet drop. The act is also an instruction uh, that is used by TCP to slow it down. And so the main, the main motivation here is that a packet is dropped when the forwarding device could be a router or a switch, uh, switch is buffer or a queue is full or close to full. Uh, meaning that if there is a, I'm assuming that I'm separating packet loss from packet drops. Packet loss could happen for any reason, could be a damaged component, could be a dirty fiber, uh, it could be a power outage. Uh, but here's more like a more focused on packet drops when intentionally the packet is dropped because the network device does not have more memory to host that packet. And that happens when the, the memory is close to full or in full utilization. So uh, the IETF community, the engineering, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force has worked in a multiple approach to make some like way for the hosts to know that the network is getting close to full or is in a full mode. For example, the ICMP source quench redux uh, was created so the routers could send ICMP message to the hosts to notify, uh, look, the, this is getting close to the limit, stop. Or also there was the explicit congestion notification, which is a single bit in the TOS uh, from the IP header that once it's signaled by the router, then the nodes know that there is a constraint in the path so they can slow it down a little bit. Both hosts need to be available or need to be aware. Uh, and the network has to be prepared to make use of those. And there is newer approaches for congestion control. BBR, for example, is a more like a delay base. You keep trying to guess the buffer utilization by measuring the delay and change of the delay that you do. So this is a, a different approach. Uh, and there are also solutions that are kind of hip hybrid that use delay base and unpack a loss base. Uh, but the key point here is that the hosts are trying to infer, They're, the hosts are trying to discover based on the information that the hosts have, what is happening to the network. They are trying to guess. And this is where we keep thinking here in key factors, what if the network device uh, or router or switch could share that information a little bit more than what ICMP source quench redux tried to do because um, that was made for an environment where everything was IP. So a router was in the same uh, VRF as a host. But now that we have uh, now that we have like VLANs and a private SP space and multiple VRFs, sometimes the host 
the routers don't get involved in that. So they have no ways to notify the hosts. So what if this could change? So this is where uh, the cube factors goals are. So first, the first goal that we have is to offload the tuning from the IT operators. Uh, we're gonna do this by developing telemetry agents they are going to be monitoring the host and looking at the host configuration from hardware, from software, and applying the tunings or making suggestions to the operators to do so. So the, the goal is dynamically tune those hosts based on those capabilities, but also adding new functionalities such, such as RTT or the round trip time or the network conditions. So now the telemetry agent having access to the network information or network state or conditions I know what the proper tuning should be because someone shared that information. It's not gonna be inferring, it's gonna be seeing that information. Um, and we're gonna be leveraging new telemetry technologies such as embed network telemetry. There are multiple programmable NICs in the market right now. And Linux now has a new, uh, very interesting functionality since 2018 that is called XTP, which is stands for Express Data Path to do this in a very low layer of the Linux uh, networking stack. So why now? Uh, what, what has enabled Q factor to do that before it was too complicated? So let's just review the challenge. The, ch the challenge right now is Q occupancy leads to packet drops in Jira and it varies per packet received, right? So, and knowing what is the Q occupancy, where is the buffer or uh, the Q utilization is very challenging those days. Um, the host protocols have to infer what the Q occupancy is because they don't have visibility. And some network devices explore Q occupancy through like telemetry, streaming telemetry solutions, uh, but those are in summaries. So you don't want to see a summary every second because in a data transfer, the Q occupancy changes per packet. Uh, so if you picture a data transfer of uh, 1 billion, um, one gigabit per second, in one second, you have 800,000 packets. Uh, and sometimes depending on the packet size, even millions of packets. So every packet, the Q occupancy is gonna change. So what has changed that now enables Q factor to try a different solution is the developing, uh, development of new technology such as in-band network telemetry in 2016, the launch of the Barefoot Intel Tofino ASIC in 2016, the launch of the, the first programmable NICs in 2016 and 2017, and a lot the launch of the first white boxes, uh, the white box that uses to finish ship in 2018. So this kind of matches the time that we submitted the proposal because that's when we got our hands first in this to finish switch. So uh, just a quick recap what in band network telemetry is. Uh, INT is in an application that records telemetry in the packet as the packet traverses two points of the network. Uh, it's done directly by the data plane, so the main device CPU is not affected, which leads to the capability of tracking every single packet. And there is no performance impact to that. So the Dolphin ship, for example, can is fully programmable, has 3.2 terabit per second of a, a forwarding plane. Uh, and there's a lot of information that you can add to the packet, and I'm going to touch a few of those now. So how does INT work? So this is a quick example. If you have two nodes, you can see the nodes on the four sides, and then you have in the, in the middle of the network five switches. So the nodes don't know that INT exists. The nodes just send a packet. The first switch of the topology adds a telemetry header and telemetry data. And that telemetry header has instructions that are going to be used by the following INT switches to add telemetry, which kind of telemetry to add, and when to stop adding telemetry. And then each switch in the path will add telemetry until you get to the final switch in the topology that we call INT sync switch. So the sync switch restores the packet, the original packet to its original configuration, and then send a telemetry to a, collect, a telemetry collector. So the telemetry collector receives a telemetry report per user packet in the topology. But the nodes is you have no clue what's going on. So these are some examples of the, what the Tofino switch supports. So you can each switch can have a switch identification, ingress port number, egress port number, ingress uh, timestamp, egress timestamp, egress QID, 
And look at that egress key walk pass, which is exactly the information we're looking for. So every switch will share what was the queue occupancy of the moment that, that packet was in the same buffer. And then you know exactly how much buffer you're using. Okay, so, so this is, uh, since now we know that the switch has a buffer or queue utilization or queue occupancy, then, you have, just a second, oh, so this is this slide. So then you can have this kind of visibility where in a very uh, like very small interval, pretty much per packet, you can see this ups and down that show exactly how much buffer is being used. And typically in, a, in our network, we, we see this behavior that you're seeing here in the screen. You have 10 kilobytes or 20 kilobytes, sometimes 40 kilobytes of data because there is no uh, bottlenecks, but, this is in uh, the ideal environment where you have some kilobytes per sec, uh, kilobytes of data being buffered, uh, and that's not noticeable by users because we're talking about microseconds of forwarding delay. But then you start having congestion that goes in thousands or tens of thousands of kilobytes of queuing, like the picture on the bottom, where suddenly you have, for example, two megabytes of packets being stored in the buffer waiting for their time to be serialized out of an interface, which means that it's going to take some time to forward that packet out of the interface. And that's going to contribute to multiple issues that the issue could be eventually I'll get to the limit of the buffer of that interface. I'm going to start dropping packets or the packets are going to start seeing jitter and delay variation, um, which goes beyond the normal. Uh, for example, here is doing the same event. You can see uh, the average hop delay and jitter, right? So this shows up a lot of VLANs and a lot of interfaces from for one switch only. And then you see here, this is the normal behavior. Uh, the forwarding delay, the time that the package spends inside the switch is an average less than five microseconds. So in those five microseconds, the package is received by the switch, processed, put it placed in the queue and sent out of the switch. But this, the, and this operates in then tens, uh, no more than tens of uh, microseconds. Uh, so these are not noticeable by users, okay? When you have microseconds. But if, especially if you are in an environment uh, where it's a campus network, you're not gonna see any of that. Uh, but only if you are in the data center kind of approach. But if you start having a lot of buffering, like the figure on the bottom, the right side on the bottom, where you go thousands of tens of thousands of microseconds delay per box, then this becomes noticeable because now we're talking about this example here shows 65 milliseconds. So 65 milliseconds, it's equivalent to go uh, almost from uh, um, light speed in the fiber from, from California to New York something like this, or a little bit less than this. But uh, that shows that just that switch is introducing enough buffering that is equivalent to 6,500 kilometers of flight propagation. And if you take in consideration the voice over IP applications, the human here is capable of start like noticing the problems with the voice after 150 milliseconds. Now we're halfway there just because of one switch. We're not even taking into consideration the propagation that's gonna take from the source to the destination. So this right away shows you that this device on that port has a problem because you're buffering way too much. Maybe it's time for traffic engineering. Maybe it's, traffic, it's time to move that traffic away or to mitigate a burst. But this uh, alone, this graph alone shows that you have a huge problem in your network. So hey, again, uh, sorry, uh, Geronimo, real quick, uh, we've got ahead. a question here. Um, can it can it take advantage of JTI Open NTI telemetry? I, I think that's a reference to Q factor. Uh, JTI is the Juniper telemetry interface. Uh, the Juniper, if that's uh, we're talking about the Juniper telemetry interface. Uh, that solution is based on summaries. That's the one that was uh, being more explicit at the beginning where it does this, uh, the streams that the telemetry reports every second. 
because that uses the main router CPU. That's the part where uh, it's different from when you have INT that is done directly by the forwarding ship that because the main router CPU is a generic, sometimes like two gigahertz CPU, and that was not done to do telemetry per packet. Uh, are we talking about the Juniper telemetry interface, Michael? Okay, perfect, thank you, uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, so when you stream summaries, uh, this is not gonna be enough. This could give you an indication. So if you have a burst that takes multiple seconds, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, it's still gonna be helpful. I'm not saying that it's useless. I'm just saying that it's not per packet. It's gonna give you less accuracy for the same measurement, but you're still gonna have something that we don't have today. Most of us don't make use of any uh, telemetry at all for queue utilization or, or queue occupancy. So it is a good solution, but it's it has a different way of operating. Uh, so coming back to the presentation, so now the INT gives you all this visibility that we talked about, it help the network operators to select better QoS policies, easy to verify tuning configuration, fast mitigation for source of jitter and packet drops. However, INT was also made for network operators. Uh, INT does not, as I showed in the picture before, the INT source and the INT sync switch, those are part of the, the network. Those are not hosts. Hosts don't have access to those. So even if I deploy INT, I could give a feedback to my user over the phone and by email, but he's still going to have no visibility of what happened at that point in time. Um, and this is the part where we want to change. So our idea is for the Q factors main uh, approach or the main goal is to create a distributed management plan. So what if we believe that if we extend this management plan or this INT domain, for example, to the hosts, those hosts could have access to the telemetry and all the network state that affected their packets at that point in time. So they could have this in real time. So this picture here shows like you have a source DTN that is the one that makes like takes the role of an INT source switch and adds uh, an INT header directly at the NIC. And the destination DTN will receive at the NIC all the telemetry and the NIC itself is going to remove the telemetry and send the packet up on the networking stack and the applications or the Linux kernel has no idea that that happened. And then uh, in possession of the, all the telemetry that the destination node has, it knows exactly the quality of the conditions of that network uh, at that point in time for that packet from source to destination. And by having that information at the destination, the destination can notify the source and ask the source to slow down or to change the tuning, which is what we're trying to accomplish with this process, uh, this project. So how will uh, Q-Factor operate? So basically Q-Factor will extend the host's capability to add and instruct telemetry as low as possible at the networking stack. So we don't wanna change applications. Nobody will need to change applications. So if you have Globals, MGTM, uh, FTP, whatever application you have, you, this does not affect you. If you have Linux, as long as you have Linux kernel uh, that is older than 415, which is like, three years ago, yes, uh, you already have XDP, you already have a BPF. So the possibility uh, of use if, of you using QFactor is very high. If you have a dedicated NIC that supports programmability, even better, but that's just uh, one way of going. So this picture shows where the telemetry can be added and where the telemetry can be removed. So there's multiple approach to do so. And we're, uh, we're going to try to use programmable NICs when available. But if you have a virtual machine, if you have a persona that runs in the Docker container, or if you have a persona that is in a, a machine that doesn't have the capability of adding another NIC, that's fine. We can use eBPF, XDP, and traffic control for that. Uh, but the key point is, this is going to be completely hidden from the upper layers. They don't know that this is happening. They don't have to care. And in the end, it's like it never happened. Uh, so this component called the limit- uh, Geronimo, uh, yes. part, sorry, uh, two slides ago, I, I believe this question is, yeah. Um, 
Uh, Tofino has a total of 22 megabytes of packet buffers. How much of this can be claimed by a single flow? I assume that some buffer must be reserved for other ports flows. One flow can't take it all. Uh, well, one flow cannot take it all because if you have just one flow in your network, that means let's say that you have an, a Tofino has like 100 gig ports, supports 32, 100 gig ports, 3.2 terabits per second. So if you have just one flow, every time that packet enters the switch, it will be alone, it will be serialized and sent out of the, the switch, right? So there's no buffering when you just have one in and one out. The only time you have buffering in the switch when you have multiple ins and one out or multiple outs, but the amount of traffic coming in the switch is more than coming uh, out of the capacity of a single port. So if you have two sources sending data at 100 gig per second, but then you have one uplink that is also 100 gig, that means they have 200 coming in, 100 to come out. Uh, then you start having those packets buffered in the buffer because the outgoing port, the egress port cannot send those packets uh, at the same pace as they come in. So you don't assign the buffering, this kind of buffering to packet. You can assign this per queue and put, place those packets in different queues. And those queues are gonna share the same 22 megabytes, okay? So if you have two flows and one flow you call high priority and the other one you call low priority, and the low priority has a best effort and the high priority has more buffer or has like a, a queue that can accommodate that data transfer, uh, that flow is going to use and uh, use going to use that queue is be sent out right away. But it's not that you are assigning that buffer to that flow. You're assigning the buffer to the queue. Okay. I I hope. Uh, let me look in the chat. Uh, I hope I clarified, Jim. But if that was not the the answer you're expecting, please uh, send more details what you're talking about. Okay. But that's that's our understanding is that when you report the Q occupancy, you report the Q occupants, you report the total amount of buffer that is used by the box. Okay, so I, I think I was in this one. Uh, so yeah, the telemetry agent will do the tuning of those hosts based on the best practices, for example, buffers. BIOS, NIC, MTU, uh, all of that that we do every day, those days. But also we we'll do the tuning based uh, on the INT metadata. So uh, using this, uh, using the, the, the queue occupancy and also the ingress timestamp and the egress timestamp, I will do uh, the telemetry agent will do a little bit more of processing and adjust those buffers to the reality that we're seeing for the network condition. Um, I'm just going to go back to James' comment. Oh, no, it's another jam. Sorry. Uh, exposing an external API to an agent that crosses over a kernel space looks risky. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit uh, towards the end. Uh, operators will have the control of the, the, the tuning. Uh, for example, the telemetry agent is going to be an active component that is going to be running and monitoring the, the performance and the, the state of the environment. And I, we understand that some operators will be kind of afraid of a component that they don't know that much will be doing the change. So we have this learning mode where we're just going to log into syslog the recommendations, and then it's up to the operator to apply those changes or not. Uh, and we're going to have this active mode that applies that tuning. So if you get to a point of Q factor, get to a point that you trust, then the Q factor telemetry agent will do this uh, for you. Uh, so in the case of Gene's questions about it, exposing an API to an application, let, let me just make sure that. Yeah, so in this, in this case, oh, what we're doing is leveraging, let's say we're using eBPF, uh, which is the most uh, is the solution that uses the kernel the most, right? It's not the programmable NIC, is eBPF. eBPF is already part of the Linux environment. Uh, you can have user applications compiling code in real time and you don't need to recompile the kernel. And basically eBPF, when used for networking, for receiving packets, 
is this is processed by uh, express data path, which is XDP. XDP uh, is going to pre-compile the code and provides a lot of restrictions in terms of what you can do. So you have a limited number of number of uh, um, actions, and you have a limited number of uh, memory to use. And you cannot have loops, for example. You have to roll out those loops. So there is it is a very constrained environment where. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately and unfortunately, does not give you a lot of flexibility. So it's not like uh, you're going to be crossing kernel or the kernel space into multiple layers because as soon as we this packet gets out of the NIC ring buffer, the telemetry agent is going to extract the telemetry and then it becomes a normal packet. And then we're just going to send this up to the networking stack and the, the networking stack doesn't even know that that happened. So TCP is gonna see the correct CRC, UDP is gonna see the correct CRC, um, all the checksums is gonna be there. Uh, you're not gonna be doing a lot of manipulation. So we're extracting this as low as possible in this stack or at the neck or before the networking stack, remove that packet and send the packet up the stack in a normal way. When we do the tuning, the tuning is using a Linux uh, API, which is CCTL, right? So anyone can do CCTL commands. You can change the buffers. And we already do this to do the tuning those days. Uh, but it's not that the telemetry agent or the data transfer application will have access to something that they don't have today. If BPF is already there, there's multiple tools that leverage BPF for uh, monitoring performance and monitoring components or monitoring syscalls. Uh, it's just that it's another tool that you're going to be building. So yes, we have to be careful with the code that you compile and place in the network. But XDP has so many validations that even like make a challenge for us to even do the basic stuff because they're very protected. They, you cannot have a packet that gets into a loop because otherwise the kernel is going to die. Nothing else is going to happen for, for the remaining packets. So this protection, uh, this security is done by eBPF. Uh, and this has been done like since the beginning of time. Uh, before eBPF, you have the BPF, which everyone use here uh, with TCP dump. Every time you use TCP dump and you do like a filter, like host and the IP address, that's BPF running and being placed low level on the stack. And that's the reason you can do TCP dump before IP tables, okay? So I hope I clarified the question, but uh, we can go back to this uh, uh, more towards the end. So this is uh, this is how the telemetry agent is going to operate. So what are the uh, we we understand that the model of distributed data plan is one of the main contributions. But in the end, to make that work, you need the telemetry agent. You need the one that is going to add the header. You need the one that's going to remove extract telemetry. You need the one that's going to process the telemetry and also apply the tuning that is necessary. So the QFACT major contribution is going to be enable the host to have the capability of consuming telemetry metadata, uh, tune those hosts based on the best practices for hardware and software configuration, but also on the network condition. And we're doing this by, and we're optimizing the hosts because we're also going to save memory by setting buffers to the proper size based on the data transfers that are taking place right now. So if I'm doing my data transfers uh, like in the science DMZ or in the regional, why should I set up my buffer to go across the globe and go to, I don't know, maybe South America, maybe Japan from the US, right? So uh, we don't want to sign those buffers and those process because then uh, it would not just be optimized. Um, so we're going to process INT queue occupancy, a hop delay to mitigate those bottlenecks. This is something that the uh, INT already support. And even if you don't have INT, this is an important like topic. INT is a very new uh, concept, and most of the networks don't have any plans to move towards INT because we, we, we understand we lack hardware. It's, all, it's mostly white box and some Cisco and Arista switches that support it. Um, so if you don't have this in your network, QFactor is still gonna help you with offloading the tuning activity. So even if you don't have INT, you just start QFactor telemetry agent, it's gonna do all that tuning that you usually do manually, going back to all those papers and all those websites or faster data. I'm not saying that doing the tuning yourself is a bad thing. No, it's a good, great way for you to learn, 
But if we could do that for you, uh, at least here in our side, we we'll, uh, appreciate that because we have a number of hosts that have to be constantly tuned. So dynamic tuning in this case is going to focus on adjusting the Linux kernel buffers, for instance, controlling the TCP windows uh, using CCTL. Uh, and the idea is something like, let's if we could summarize in one statement, statement would be like, uh, if there's only 24 gigabits per second available in the end-to-end -end, end path, why trying to use a data rate above the available limit and phase drops, right? So uh, Brian Turney has presented this and multiple people have presented this, the how using pacing for TCP could be a, a thing that contributes uh, to the data transfer. Even if you have to set a pacing that's a lot smaller, like it's lower, uh, lower than the capacity of an interface. But if you know that you don't have that much bandwidth available, why are you trying to push the limits and then phase packet drops and then create those bumps and, and the TCP data transfer? So the idea is that if you have INT, you're gonna kind of estimate what is the, based on those, uh, those uh, metadata, what is the bandwidth available? Then you set a pacing, like an actual pacing for TCP and then you set the, uh, which sets the limit, don't try to go beyond that. And that could change after five seconds, right? Then the burst that was taking uh, the network resource is no longer there. Then you increase the pace into a hundred and then you set to 50, but you're not gonna be doing this per packet, right? So you're gonna be doing this based on feedback that you get from the network. And uh, knowing uh, since the telemetry agents will be focused on tuning, then you can even do like, uh, a, a change of the congestion control algorithm. You, if you have a node that is still using a, an old congestion control algorithm like Reno or H uh, or Cubic or any other one, HTCP, then you can you can negotiate this because now the telemetry agents will be talking to one another. So just an example. So we talk about tuning a lot. Let's use an example. When we apply tuning and when we don't apply tuning. We were going to apply when the telemetry agent uh, confirms that that's a default configuration for general use. So if you want to do data transfer, then the telemetry agent is going to adjust the network, uh, the host to do data transfer. It's not going to be for generic use. We're not going to create a telemetry agent that do, does tuning for every possible scenario. No, it's going to be focused on DTNs, data transfer between nodes. Uh, if the telemetry agent identifies that the buffer, the tuning parameters are under provision, congestion control or TCP congestion buffers or write buffers, then it can make a suggestion or make a change. If we start seeing that the data transfers highest round trip time is greater than 50 milliseconds, which means that it's now more, not regional anymore. Maybe we're talking about even like in between states, uh, or in between countries in Europe, uh, then, okay, so now it makes sense to do this tuning because 50 milliseconds after 20 milliseconds of round trip time, TCP is just gonna start showing some effects. So we want to improve this right away. So those numbers that have asterisks because they are still being evaluated. And you can apply a tuning, you can tune it up or it could tune down. So you can tune it up if you start seeing that the network has plenty of buffers available, uh, that the, the hop delay inside the switch is very like two microseconds, for example, but you can tune it down if you start seeing that the buffers, uh, as mentioned, someone mentioned uh, it was 22 megabytes, but if you start seeing 18, that means they're pretty close to the limit. So why trying to make it to 22 and then start having packet drops? Uh, or if you start seeing that the hop delay is 50 microseconds, then you, you see that, well, maybe it's time for, for the TCP start low, slowing down the data transfer to avoid creating more impact. So maybe uh, what we can say here that we're transferring to the operational system, not just for TCP to do a control of the data transfers and trying to be as optimized as possible. Uh, cases where we're not gonna apply any tuning, uh, the data transfers is like a data center kind of a round trip time. So, there's no much that you can do under 10 milliseconds to really improve TCP. If you had um, some changes made, like setting the BIOS to performance mode and, and this kind of stuff, but you're not gonna, you don't need to set like two gigabytes of buffer for TCP because uh, you're not gonna use this if 
the high, like the highest round trip time is 10 milliseconds. Uh, so if you start seeing that the host's bandwidth, it's already at the maximum capacity. If it's a 10 gig node and it's using 10 gig, why should you tune up, right? You're not gonna use more than 10 gigs. It's a physical limitation. The same thing for CPU. If you see that the CPU is already 100%, why pushing, uh, trying to uh, push it uh, above 100% since you know it's not going to go beyond 100%. Same thing for swap. Uh, or in some cases, you're using a different congestion control algorithm like BPR, and you see that based on the conditions of the network, it doesn't make sense because there's no buffer, for example. So this is uh, the workflow uh, that we have once you start the telemetry agent. Uh, you have a phase of assessment, then you have a phase where you make recommendations. And the, the great part here on the metal, it's kind of, if you have an NT in a network, then you can use NT. If you don't have it, it just skip it. So this is like an optional phase. And then this is the loop that we care the most is the learning loop where you learn based on the conditions and you apply tuning or not if you're, you don't trust the system. But if you trust, let's pretend that you keep in this loop here in a very small interval that could be seconds or a milliseconds. This is to be defined. So where are we now? Uh, uh, again, Q Factor is a CC Star project integration uh, is for two years. We're a little bit behind because we struggled to recruit. Uh, and with the pandemic, as most of you, there's there are moments that we had to stop like recruitment. There are multiple layers of approvals. There's the whole thing created by the pandemic. So. Um, I, I, I can say that we're very late right now, uh, but we, we have some, we achieved some milestones already. So we have test beds for those nodes. We have the code that adds telemetry. We have the codes that extract telemetry using eBPF. Uh, and this creates the environment for us to keep developing the telemetry agent. So the tuning module right now, uh, it's a very under active development, like very heavy development right now. And as the next steps, we plan to start moving the, the INT phase of adding and extracting to the programmable NICs. So we still have to get hands in some of those NICs. Um, uh, but right now, we're still focused on uh, eBPF. Uh, one of the things we're doing, uh, we got very uh, lucky in the sense that we got funded to also have a postdoc or someone that is going to be researching and thinking. We have people that are going to be doing development and we have people that are going to be doing the thinking. And, and now we're going through this literature review where we go to all the papers and all the websites that talk about doing tuning. Uh, and let's combine and learn from all of those because we're going to have to learn and develop uh, those learning techniques that are going to be observation based. There's not machine learning. It's not going to be AI. It's not going to be a heavy learning. It's just like if the tuning is this, or if the buffer is that, do this, something very simple. Uh, and everything uh, that we have is hosted and will be hosted in GitHub and the public repositories. So science drivers, uh, who benefits from Q-Factor? I would say everyone that does data transfer, right? It could be high throughput computing applications such as LHC1, OST, EHT, or uh, real-time high availability such as Vero Rubin, but I would say the mostly international research test beds, Big Data Express, PRP, Fabric, all the gold sense, those will benefit the most because there is a research, research component on Q factor. And ideally, we're going to test in those test beds first. And I would say from our side as a network operators, uh, we benefit this a lot because we have to do a lot of tuning for our persona nodes for our science DMZs, for our DTNs. So if we could leverage like a tool that does that for us, uh, we'll pretty much like take it. So uh, how do we plan to engage the community? Uh, so QFactor still has a, a long road ahead. As I said, we're kind of late. The goal is to go another year, maybe a year and a half uh, of software development and evaluations. We're very open to uh, for suggestions and collaboration. So if you have, uh, we have seen that other C star projects uh, are doing something similar with tuning. Uh, some are doing tuning uh, and all, some are doing like streaming telemetry from the optical layer. So we're very eager to hear from all those projects. 
Uh, and once we're ready for production, then one of the things we want to ask the community is, what kind of use case do you have that you think would benefit by having dynamic tuning and also stream telemetry and the per packet basis? Uh, and then we'll obviously we're gonna start asking the community. So, what do you think Q factors should go next? Do you think it makes sense to keep doing this, or this is way beyond what we need? Then maybe uh, we should go another direction, which is which is fine. And we have our Slack workspace. Uh, it's open. Um, there's not a lot of discussions right now. The team is is, is kind of small. But if you have use cases or if you want to see more, what we're doing. Uh, please feel free to join us at this qfactor.select.com. I see that there is a question. Janetti, you want to read the question? Sure. Um, you say international research test beds will get the most advantage, but the international links generally are not congested. Uh, the Asian links, for example, are used at 5%. How will they benefit? <clears throat> well, uh, the international links, yes, maybe, but what about after that? So from the international to the regional, to the host, to the metro, all the way to the uh, to the sensor or desktop or whatever the, wherever the DTN is. Not, not necessarily the DTNs are connected to directly to the international links. Sometimes they are connected to an exchange point and that exchange point has other links. So I understand if you don't have buffering, um, then it's just going to benefit by by the basic tuning that those nodes have to uh, to go through. Uh, if you have buffering, if you start seeing that uh, maybe the international part doesn't have it, but the exchange point has, or maybe the international point is going through supercomputing, and then you have someone putting traffic on it, then you're going to benefit from that. But there's no benefit if you do the tuning for maxing out the capacity of a node and the links don't have traffic, uh, yes, very little improvement in this sense uh, because the international or the academic community, usually they have a lot more bandwidth than need in most of the case for the international links. But I'm like, for example, which is the network that I'm uh, uh, operating right now, uh, we have 100 gig international links that support the test pads. And then we have RMP in Brazil, which is the Brazilian NRAN. And RMP has 10 gig links connected to us. And sometimes they have 10 gig links connected to nodes. And they don't have 100 gig DTN. So um, in some cases, uh, it's not just about the link, but the link itself is just one component in the test pad. If you have in the end to end path any place that is congested, and supports telemetry, then you benefit. But if your network is empty, yes, there's no point for doing tuning outside of the default tuning of setting buffers. We got another question here, if, if you want to go through that. Because sure. um, uh, you were you seem like you were just uh, wrapping up the last your last slide. We can go back to that if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, so the goal was to show the team uh, mm -hmm. that is involved. Um, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Could you elaborate on what would be required to add an INT to more conventional, for example, non P4 Tofino white box type devices? Getting good per Q statistics like buffer occupancy can be quite complicated due to the architectural differences and the ways buffers are carved. For example, shared versus dedicated peer point per point versus per service, et cetera. Yeah. And or not having easy access to no standard API to this telemetry. Is there any list of requirements or standards you could uh, provide to a vendor that specifies what telemetry data needs to be exported, such as slide in slide 11 and via what mechanism? Okay, so uh, I'll go back to slide 11. Okay, yeah, no. Um, well, this is an example, but the P4, uh, the P4 INT application, INT is a use case of a, a P4 language. Uh, the uh, IETF community has already created what they call, uh, they have another name for in situ, in situ uh, uh, network telemetry. Uh, I think that's the name. There's a working group in IETF to also standardize. 
uh, this approach of telemetry, but uh, they don't go into the details of how that's gonna be implemented into the hardware. So it could be any ship, but the point is if you don't have a ship that supports this sort of programmability, because as you said, sometimes it's very complicated to repartition a, a TCAM, for example, or any memory. And sometimes it's not possible. Uh, you, if you have a box that is, I, yeah, exactly, IOIAM. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so uh, yeah, in situ operational administration and management, I think, yeah. So um, if, you, uh, if you have a TCAM, like let's, let's pick the current existing TCAMs right now. Uh, you're not going to do much of this, uh, but you can still do it as summaries. So the journey per telemetry uh, interface that we discussed before is a great example. Yeah, that there is a limit that you can do it, but you don't want to uh, consume all the CPU for exporting telemetry per packet. So you're going to create summaries, something like NetFlow has done in interface or sampling like you we have done with SFlow. But if you want to full INT or per packet telemetry, it could be, um, maybe that's way too much for your need, but it has to be one of these new ships that are prepared for this, right? All the ships, they have this kind of information. The point is, how do you export that without killing the box? This is, this is the main change. So that's the reason we have the summers because those devices, they keep those counters and they keep processing those counters, but they don't export. It's just in between the data plane and counter plane inside the same box. But if you want to start generating reports that have to be exported out of the box through the main CPU, you're going to kill that box. So uh, the Jamper telemetry solution or Arista telemetry solution, those are good examples. You can have sometimes in the CLI some information. For example, in Arista, you can have INT. Uh, and then you can start seeing all those flows inside the box, right? In the CLI, you can start having this sort of uh, uh, monitoring, but you don't get to consume that out of the box with the same granularity. So the challenge is changing the hardware and the way how you have the hardware today. I think it, it's very complicated. Um, I, I'm not an expert in that. So what I can say is that uh, all the solutions that don't have a new ship that focus on that, they have to leverage the control plane, so they do summary. So that's that's my uh, my vision of this. Uh, is the ITF group? You yes, that's the one. Uh, in uh, in situ OEM, yes. And There's then another question. Yeah, is your WAN built entirely out of Tofino switches? Uh, okay, so. The, net, the M line network, I didn't explore the M line network, but M line is focused more like in transport. Uh, we do uh, SDN to transport between lo uh, localities and, and, and sites and countries. And I'll, the IP routing is still done in IP routers, the legacy IP routers. So we don't do the IP routing on the Dofino because Dofino was not built to have 2 million IP entries in the memory. So the memory is limited to, I think, 450,000 entries. Uh, so, uh, but our role is an exchange point is just to forward traffic and we do this on a layer two basis. So if you call that a WAM network that we do, like we have network in Chile, Brazil, Panama, Puerto Rico, multiple places in the US and Africa. Uh, yes, all of this will, will be Tofino. Not all the sites are ready yet. We have Brazil and US right now ready for Tofino and with the final box installed. Okay, Matt. Okay, we, yeah, we've got another one here. Oh, two, two questions here. Is Q-Factor targeting a particular rate to update host parameters? I can imagine a constellation of Q-Factor enabled hosts oscillating instead of reaching a consensus. Yes, uh, that's a good point. Um, so if you have, uh, one of the challenges that we see for, for Q Factor is if you have, let's pick out an example, like a real science driver, the, the telescope that I talked before, the Vera Rubin telescope, they will have in the same subnet 10 DTNs processing the data, and all the 10 DTNs will send the data at the same time through the same link. They are in the same subnet, they go to 10 de different destination DTNs in the US, right? So if you have each one of those, 
uh, with QFact and operating like in standalone mode, there's two possibilities that I see. One is going to kill the network or none of the Q factor agents are going to work because they're going to be selling down, like setting down, setting down until that there's no data exchange, like buffer overflows. So what we created for Q factor that I didn't talk about is that for situations where you have multiple nodes sharing the same subnet, there is a remote collector node where all the telemetry is going to be exported to that node that's only going to be doing this sort of processing and sharing through gRPC through the API to each node, how much or what kind of tuning must be done on that node. So there's going to be a central component to evaluate this. But even if you have a constellation, as you said, multiple individual GTNs per site, uh, eventually they were going to have to reach consensus, uh, assuming that all of them struggle to the same link, for example, through the same box. They will have to leverage the telemetry to start making those adjustments. So there is some research component on this part is how we're going to do this. Um, I, I don't have a full answer to you how this is going to be implemented, but we, we see this as a challenge. Are there plans to support the in-band telemetry feature set that broadband uh, started, including with the Jericho and newer family of chips used by most network vendors? Uh, well, thank you, Michael, for, for the question. Uh, so one of the things I forgot to mention, the Q-factor leverage telemetry uh, from, from, from the network. Right, so Q-Factor is not funded to change the network to add Tofino switches. So Q-Factor focus on the nodes. We, it were, in, the, in our case, we're fortunate to have a partner such as Amlite that has the Tofino switches and ESNet that has a, a telemetry solution that we're also accommodating with this. But we're not getting to the effort of changing those switches or doing the P4 pipeline. We're just leveraging what those switches support. I know Broadcom had solutions for telemetry in the past at the same time that Tofino was released. Um, but every time I try to get more information from Broadcom about the solution, it was never the same uh, 101 telemetry base. Okay, so I, I don't know if there are plans to add INT to any of the Broadcom uh, uh, ship lines or including Jericho, uh, but I would say, from what we've seen so far from all the interactions with the vendors and those who develop software for those kind of ship is most of the time you have to come up with a new ship for that. Uh, it's not that easy. So if we go back like a, six years ago uh, when we had that idea of uh, open flow, right? Uh, a lot of people are talking about open flow and then a lot of people say, well, can we use the current devices and this and the manufacturers start using the ACLs, the, the access control lists as a open flow entry. And that kind of solved the problem for some point, but then you're limited to the number of ACLs that a box supports, like 2,000, 4,000. And people wanted to use open flow for 40,000, 100,000, 1 million entries. So you could do some accommodation to export some telemetry. That's what Jennifer is doing, for example but you're not going to uh, just leveraging old ships to, to export 101. And honestly, since 2019, uh, when I had those first meetings with Broadcom, they, they never provided any update to our question. So I, I honestly don't know. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and grab the screen real quick. Um, There's one. Yeah. I just I, I I just want to get through a couple of community updates and then um, we can just go back to the questions. So um, we have um, our next webinar is Monday, October twenty fifth at eleven a.m. Eastern. Uh, our topic is legal insights with uh, four time webinar champion uh, Scott Russell. He's a member of Trusted CI. Uh, people always enjoy his talks. So. Um, Come join us then. We also have a webinar later this week uh, involving science gateways, um, security recommendations from science gateways. This will be presented by a member of Trusted CI, Mark Krenz, and that is going to be Wednesday, September 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern. To learn more, go to sciencegateways.org slash engage slash webinars. 
And also, if you are interested in the um, 2021 NSF Cybersecurity Summit, registration is open, so please register. Um, we have limited seating, and so we want people who are involved in NSF projects to take their take advantage of their seat, so please go ahead and register. You can find out more at trustedci.org slash 2021 Cybersecurity Summit. Okay, um, let's go back to the chat. We had one more question, oh, two more questions. Um, uh, Geronimo, are you okay uh, sticking around? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, one more question. Here we go. How will QFactor work with tuning parameters working differently on heterogeneous OS's uh, kernel versions? Um, at this point, Marcus, we're only planning to use Linux. Okay. It could be Debian or it could be CentOS. We're going to be using those. Uh, and basically, what we're doing is like, it's it's like creating a dictionary of how each one of those operational systems uh, work with their attributes. So it's like we're creating a knowledge base for those uh, and we're gonna be doing this. It has to be a manual activity. There's no machine learning that discover how a kernel is gonna work. So during the, the scope of the project, we're gonna be learning about this. We're gonna be doing tasks. We're gonna be using the, the, the DTNs. Right now we have DTNs that are CentOS. We have DTNs that are uh, Debian, we have DTNs, there are uh, uh, 10 gig, DTNs, there are 100 gig, uh, and we have to create this knowledge base. And once we create the knowledge base, the telemetry agent will have in the future like a list of supported kernel versions and supported Linux distributions, right? So we're not planning to do anything for Windows, uh, for any different Unix right now, because there is a time constraint right now, and all the DTNs that we have right now we use or CentOS or, or Debian. And uh, kernel versions, that, that's always going to be a challenge, right? So we're going to go with the, the ones that fully support eBPF and XTP the way we need. Uh, and right now it's basically the, I think 5.10 is the one that comes with uh, CentOS or Debian, and that's the one you use. And once new versions start being released, then uh, we're going to have to dedicate some time to learn. And maybe, who knows, maybe in the future, there's a follow-up to QFactor and this becomes a thing and then we get funded and we keep doing this development effort for as long as the community needs. Uh, but right now we're doing based on the notes that we most we see the people using the most, the configuration that we see uh, the most. Well, great. Well, um, any final thoughts, Geronimo? Uh, well, uh, again, uh, Really, thank you for the opportunity. I know uh, some people in the audience were expecting something more security related. Uh, there, were, there were opportunity for going to inside, <laughs> going to this topic, but I'm glad that we, we shared the message that we had and we're very happy. And in behalf of the QFactor team, uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you uh, all of you for, for the questions. Yes, thank you, um, the audience. You've been great. So um, I'm going to be uh, cutting a recording of this later today. So we'll, you should be getting a copy of it soon. And uh, with that, I'll end the meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Have a great day. Stay safe. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Bye.